spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Aloha, happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us here on Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. And Ryan, we have a guest who always gets a lot of questions, and today, someone who broke some news yesterday. Yeah, excited to begin this conversation uh, with Governor David Ige about some news that, as Yanji mentioned, broke yesterday. Good morning, Governor. Thanks so much for joining us once again. Uh, let's just jump right in uh, and talk about Aloha Stadium and your thoughts about the future of the stadium moving in a different direction with management and overall if, if you can explain uh, some of the decisions that you've made most recently with the future of aloha stadium sure thanks uh, thanks ryan um just just to be clear you know we are committed to completing the construction of a new stadium at the aloha stadium site as quickly as possible so um, you know, legislature really changed directions again this uh, session, and there's significant changes. They moved the project from DAGS to DBED, and certainly we're working through what um, that means. In addition, they, they dramatically changed the financing uh, of the project. You know, they provided for the first time sufficient funds to construct the stadium, $350 million in general obligation bonds and they provided $50 million to operate the facility going forward. So, you know, we're looking at all of those changes and trying to um, assess where we were uh, and really about what makes the most sense going forward. So, you know, yesterday's announcement and just looking at um, how the public-private partnership uh, was being shaped um, in the RFPs that DAGS has uh, been in the middle of, uh, certainly it seemed different than where we are today. And, and that's why we uh, decided to uh, stop the RFP. You know, Chris Kinimaka, who's been on this program, uh, she's the public works administrator for DAGS. When she was uh, asked by the paper about this decision, she described it as a lightning bolt out of the blue. Are you concerned about money and time that has already been spent on, you know, the road that they were going down to this point and all that work essentially being lost? You know, Yanji, I don't believe that all that work will be lost. Uh, as you know, um, they did complete environmental impact statement, and I, I did approve that. Um, you know, we had they had a, a, a number of charrettes about um, what the stadium could look like, and I, I'm, I'm confident that we can uh, use a lot of that work. Um, clearly, uh, you know, they were um, pursuing a, a partnership that was designed, build, finance, operate, and maintain. It was the whole package. Uh, and clearly, the current uh, appropriations from the legislature is very different. They've appropriated sufficient funds to construct the stadium. Uh, and they did provide funds to operate. So, you know, we believe that we'll have to uh, change how uh, we proceed uh, going forward. You know, we're trying to make that assessment. We want to make sure we can incorporate and use as much of the work that has already been done. Uh, and we uh, definitely are interested in, in getting it completed as quickly as possible. So, you know, we anticipate just simplifying rather than a complicated uh, public private partnership um, that, as I said, was designed, build, finance, operate, and uh, manage. Uh, we'll probably be looking at simplifying the project so we can accelerate it as quickly as possible. Do you feel that this decision to sort of switch gears uh, in, in this phase will push the project back even more? I think from a public standpoint, anytime they hear something about a big public works project being potentially you know, debated over uh, and, and new leadership coming in, that there is that fear that, oh no, here we go again, this is gonna be a, another rail project where we have an, ex, you know, an extended timeline, a bigger budget. How much do you think that this will impact the one timeline and the overall budget for a project of this magnitude? 
You know, Ryan, I think the thing that I am most optimistic about for the first time, the legislature did pro provide uh, and appropriate sufficient funds to complete a new stadium. So, you know, in the past, they had provided revenue bonds and other um, um, different kinds of financing mechanisms that clearly wasn't sufficient uh, to fund the project. Um, so, you know, we are making the assessment. We want to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, we now believe we have uh, the appropriations necessary to really complete the project for the first time. Uh, you know, and um, just just um, a note that the legislature has changed direction on this project three or four times, which is why um, the project has been delayed so often. Uh, we now have all the authorizations that we need to really move forward and complete the project. Andrew Gomes, who is a reporter, of course, for the paper, has a question this morning, says, is the plan to have DBED seek low bids to just design and build a new stadium? I mean, are you essentially saying that the public-private partnership is dead? And, and what do you say to Andrew this morning? Yeah, <clears throat> Yanji, what I would say is that the public-private partnership will be different than what had been envisioned at DAGS. As I said, you know, it was a complete package, design, build, finance, operate, maintain. Um, and we were, we're trying to look at what's the best way to proceed forward, simplifying at least the construction of the stadium portion. We do anticipate that there'll be a public-private partnership, but it will be uh, structured very differently than um, the RFP that was being worked on by DAGS. Okay, so to Andrew's question, is that essentially the plan going forward? Yeah, like I said, Yanji, we'll make an announcement in about three weeks or sooner if we can finish all the preliminary work that we need. We are looking at the RFP, the, the one that was um, uh, being worked on by DAGS and really looking at what we can use from that and um, thinking about how to structure the project differently. You know, as you um, as you are aware, the, um, especially in terms of finances, uh, the current uh, financial situation is so different than when it was uh, even a year ago. Um, you know, interest rates are going and we know that the state always can borrow money at the lowest rates of anybody um, here in the state. So private financing of, of the project really is no longer necessary. And so it's those kinds of changes that we want to make sure we can incorporate into the best um, best method, best project moving forward. And just overall, to get your sense of the project as a whole, I mean, do you support this concept of the entertainment district with housing on the site? Or, or do you feel that it should be more focused just towards what it is now uh, with the stadium uh, and not really spending the financing and the time to structure a more comprehensive entertainment district as was proposed? You know, Brian, I do think that the concept of an entertainment district still makes sense, right? What we're focusing on is the stadium itself. You know, that's the direction provided by the legislature. They appropriated um, $350 million specifically to um, knock down the old stadium and construct a new stadium. And as I said, they also provided additional funds to operate the facility. Um, you know, th we are still interested in, in housing and other activities on the site that will be proceeding forward. But, you know, the reality is there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to move that forward. We got to subdivide the parcels. We need to have a master plan. There's very... Um, um, limited uh, infrastructure, you know, sewer and water is necessary um, in, in order for us to proceed. So it really is looking at all of those issues, making an assessment about where we are, and then looking at what's the best way forward. So focus on the stadium with the funds provided by the legislature. Uh, think about what housing and what we would need to do to move forward with the housing. Yeah, obviously the entertainment district is something that um, is of interest, but um, clearly um, we want to get the stadium portion of the project uh, done and completed as quickly as possible. 
you know, three of your predecessors, and we've talked about this in the past, have said that the stadium itself on its face is a bad idea and that that focus should be purely on housing. Um, as you know, when you make a big change like this, obviously it re, you know, that debate comes up again. What do you say to folks who think that that should be an, a, a, a district that is purely dedicated to housing? Why do we need a sports facility at all in that area? You know, Yanji, I, I do believe it's important that we have a sports facility. And, um, you know, it really is a big part of the University of Hawaii. Um, you know, I I have to confess, I'm a graduate and a fan. And I really do think that um, athletics and the opportunity to participate is just really important to our community uh, for the athletes uh, who are here in the islands, um, but um, also just for the general public and the fan. Um, you know, we've uh, done well in, in different areas. Uh, I do believe there's support for football at the University of Hawaii. We do need to have a stadium that is appropriate, especially if we want to continue to, to play in the, um, the Mountain West Conference or, you know, if we aspire to be joining uh, one of the other big conferences, we do need to have a facility that's appropriate. All right, we want to switch gears here because we do have other topics to talk to besides Aloha Stadium. Uh, so let's uh, let's move on here. You know, there there are some that are calling the leg for the legislature to convene a special session uh, and draft a new law that would reverse a recent ruling by the Hawaii C Supreme Court that limits prosecutors when uh, indicting serious criminals. Now, this is because an amendment to the state's constitution back in the 1980s uh, and specific language that some people are calling to be changed immediately. Would you be in favor? Uh, of this special session? And do you think that lawmakers should be called back into session to change this? You know, Ryan, we uh, continue to uh, dialogue with the legislature about how they would want to proceed. Uh, you know, just a reminder that um, any kind of legislation um, would uh, be prospective uh, only. It's pretty rare that we provide for retroactive retroactivity, um, you know, essentially the Supreme Court ruled and uh, impacted um, all of those issues going forward. So I don't see um, the sense of urgency to uh, try to implement a change. Um, it would be very difficult to have it applied to previous cases. Um, I do think that it's about um, recognizing that um, the Supreme Court has ruled we have to pursue grand jury indictments for most of the serious uh, crimes. Uh, there are a number of uh, pending cases in process and uh, we'll definitely have to work to get uh, grand juries convened to consider those. Um, but until we have consensus on what the changes would be necessary, you know, I think it's premature to really talk about a special session. Okay. Since the last time you were on, the Navy did release a truncated timeline when it comes to Red Hill, shaving off about three months to the end of the defueling process. Uh, tell us your th thoughts on the timeline and also now the uh, appointment of Rear Admiral Wade to spearhead this effort. You know, thanks, Yanji. I really um, I think that it's a, a huge step forward, uh, the appointment of Rear Admiral Wade. I don't know him. I don't know if I've met him before, but um, but the Navy assigning someone uh, to be in charge uh, and hopefully so that they can follow through until it's completed, I think is something that I've advocated for. You know, I've expressed my um, desire to have uh, some of the um, commands here um, stay put until we can resolve these really difficult issues. Um, Yanji, as you know, the next step um, in moving forward, or I guess the first step in defueling uh, the, the tanks is to really unpack them. And what that means is, you know, the current pipelines on Red Hill are f uh, full of fuel and it's under pressure. So uh, we definitely have to remove the fuel from all the pipelines. And then um, their defueling plan says that we need to make critical repairs prior to us being able to, to defuel safely. Uh, and we do want to get started with that work as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, we continue to work and look at the plans that they issued 
uh, to really understand what they are proposing and what the timeline. You know, we've had um, working level discussions with the Navy and we believe that they are committed to doing it as quickly as it is safe. Uh, and, you know, this uh, issuing the plan is really the next step. We look forward to working with them, uh, holding their feet to the fire and really defueling as quickly as safe. You know, currently there are a group of Hawaii residents who have been impacted by Red Hill and who are passionate about this issue who are in Washington, D.C. right now, uh, sort of making their voices heard and, and asking for you know accountability and asking for this disaster and this mess to be cleaned up in an expedited and efficient manner. Uh, what would you say to those who have been impacted, who feel like their voices uh, aren't being heard, who feel like this timeline is is not acceptable, that it is going to take too long, and that it still poses a threat. Do you believe that things are safe for the time being? And, and how would you address the concerns of those who just feel like this timeline of even shaved off three months is still too long? You know, Ryan, I just would want to ask the public to uh, continue to be patient. Obviously, remember, uh, eight months ago, there were no plans to shut down the facility. They were operating it. The Navy provided assurances that it was safe uh, to operate and that the aquifer was it in jeopardy. Um, now we have the situation, the Navy acknowledges that, um, that the facility is uh, not safe to operate. They've uh, committed to defueling uh, and they've committed to decommissioning. Um, so, I, you know, I want to make sure that we do it in a safe way. I mean, I wish that we could uh, turn the spigots and defuel in, in six months, but that's not realistic. And I'm not and I'm not comfortable um, knowing that there are deficiencies in the current system that could create bigger environmental impact than we've seen so far. Uh, so, you know, I, I do believe that the Navy has changed um, their perspective on the facility. They're committed to making the improvements to um, make it safe to operate. And then they're committed to defuel as quickly as possible. So, you know, we're going to hold their feet to the fire and continue to work on behalf of our community. There's a clip that's making its way around the internet right now that 60 Minutes released in an interview with Joe Biden at the Detroit Auto Show in an interview, uh, essentially saying that in his mind, the pandemic is over. Do you agree with the president on that assessment? Yeah, um, Yanji, I don't believe that the pandemic is over. You know, we are seeing steady progress. Um, this week, we're down to um, uh, less than 140 cases. You know, we still are seeing uh, across the country 400 people die um, from COVID or complications due to COVID. So it's still a, a serious disease. You know, we need to um, do the things we know that work. Um, you know, I the issuance and the approval of the bivalent uh, vaccine is really important, and I would encourage everyone. Uh, to get uh, the new uh, bivalent vaccine as quickly as they're eligible. Um, that really um, does make a difference. Um, you know, and I do think that we are learning to live with COVID a whole lot better than we were even uh, two months ago. But I do want to remind the public that in June of this year, we were averaging more than 1,000 cases a day. Uh, we're at about 140, um, which um, is much, much lower, but it's still a concern. So um, we continue to, to fight this public health um, emergency and really working uh, to keep our community safe. We appreciate everyone's efforts to get vaccinated and wear a mask when appropriate. I want to just get an update on that bivalent vaccine. Have you talked to the Department of Health recently or, or gotten an update from them on the supply? We know that there are many out there in the community who are uh, eagerly waiting for that and, and interested in, in getting that booster. What have you heard about the availability of this and the supply coming to Hawaii? You know, uh, Ryan, we uh, know that the state has uh, ordered um, 56,000 doses up to this point of Pfizer and Moderna. Um, uh, we also um, note that uh, the federal government is distributing directly to the pharmacies that they've been working with. So, um, you know, that will continue to happen. Um, you know, I certainly encourage people 
uh, to look at the pharmacy of their choice, whether that's Long's or Times or uh, the neighborhood pharmacy, and uh, just uh, try to make an appointment. You know, and they need to just keep trying. Um, the pharmacies are getting supply of vaccines. They are making it available. They're scheduling. I do know that some pharmacies uh, continue to, to do just walk-in vaccinations. They have enough uh, vaccines that they are just um, uh, providing it when anybody who walks in. So um, certainly I encourage everyone to um, to do that. Um, the, the federal government um, um, site uh, can point you to at least the pharmacies that have doses. I do believe that all of the pharmacies in Hawaii have gotten the bivalent of vaccination. It's always a grab bag of questions. We've got one from Christine Donnelly, Donnelly who writes the Kokua column. She says, has the governor received any estimates about how much money was lost to fraud in COVID-19 relief programs in Hawaii? I'm sure it's hard pressed to give a number off the top of your head, but what are your thoughts about COVID-19 relief program fraud? And, and do you have any kind of estimate on the scope of that? Yeah, um, Yanji, we don't have a real um, specific number. We do think that um, we were helped a little bit about, uh, you know, in terms of UI, because the real, the real uh, big fraud, um, big dollar fraud was really focused on UI. Um, this is one instance where our antiquated computer system actually helped us because uh, it was hard to hack into the mainframe to really um, perpetrate um, um, wide scale frauds. There were, there were a lot of things that we could do to catch it. I mean, you know, my uh, identity was uh, stolen and I was informed that I uh, became unemployed and was eligible for, um, for benefits, even though that wasn't true. Um, so, you know, I have been working with um, um, UI and trying to give an estimate. You know, we know that we have to reimburse the federal government for fraud that we find. Um, remember that we've distributed $6 billion in UI benefits. And uh, Anne thinks um, that the, her she would estimate about uh, $10 million or so in fraud that we um, have identified. We're holding up, um, you know, we'll continue to work uh, with the federal government to uh, pursue uh, fraud when we uh, can identify it. We also have a question about the $300 tax uh, refund that was announced uh, through the legislature's approval uh, and the plan that you had initially floated out there at the beginning of the session, which started at $100, was approved at $300, and you made the announcement of the direct deposits and also the uh, physical checks that will be in the mail. But what can you tell us about that progress? Uh, they are getting some reports from people who said they are still waiting for their checks, some waiting for the deposits. How are things going on that front with the refunds? Yeah, thanks, Ryan, for that question. Uh, just just to remind people, you know, if you filed your tax return, then you don't have to do anything. Uh, if you got a tax refund via direct deposit, you will get a direct deposit into your account. If you had a tax refund via a paper check, then you'll get a paper check. But as long as you filed uh, and completed your um Hawaii state income tax, you will get that rebate. Um, I just spoke with uh, Isaac um, just before getting on, and he said that all of the direct deposit um, refunds have been processed. So um, anyone who got a direct deposit uh, refund for their income taxes should um, receive the, the refund in the next day or so. They've all been processed. It's in the in the process of being distributed to the banks. The paper checks continue as we get um, stock to cut the checks. We are cutting the checks. Uh, as we had said, we will be complete um, by the end of October. Uh, we are actually ahead of schedule in terms of getting refund checks out, um, you know, and the supply chain issue of the paper checks is the only thing that would be a delay. I want to go back. I'm just so curious. This is the first I've heard of your identity being stolen. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how it was ultimately resolved? And forgive me if you've spoken about this publicly. Um, I, I don't remember hearing about this. No, I mean, uh, early on in the pandemic, um, uh, when the unemployment system was constantly being attacked, you know, that was the key 
um, access point that people were doing it. Um, somehow my uh, name, social security number, date of birth um, was available to some hacker. They, um, they did submit an unemployment claim um, in my name. I did turn over all of that information to the attorney general's office and the UI office. Uh, and they uh, were pursuing, um, trying to determine uh, how that occurred. Obviously, the request was to uh, deposit uh, unemployment benefits into a, a bank account that wasn't my bank account. Um, we did um, flag that as fraud, and I know that it's been investigated. I didn't hear what the, uh, what the outcome was of that. Well, our time is almost up, uh, but before we let you go, we've been ending our conversations with you over the past few weeks uh, uh, on a lighter note because we do know you only have 11 more weeks left in office. And so uh, one of the questions that we have for you today is, of course, as governor, you live in uh, the governor's residence, which is located behind Washington's place. Uh, what is one thing that you'll miss the most about living in that residence? And, and you know, it is a, a, a house that many don't get the opportunity to see or, or we see it when we drive by. Uh, but what will you miss the most about living and being on the grounds of Washington place and living in the in the governor's residence? Uh, you know, Ryan, it um, it really has been uh, great to be in the residence. I think the thing that I will miss the most is just the convenience of living across the street from the Capitol, across the street from my office, uh, and really not having to deal with, you know, the commutes. Uh, normally, it would take me a minimum of 45 minutes um, coming in in the morning and 45 minutes uh, going home. That's if there's no... no traffic uh, accident or stalled vehicle or anything like that. Um, so um, certainly uh, being uh, less than five minutes away has made a huge difference in not having to uh, deal with the stress of driving in every day. Um, it's allowed me to be more productive. Obviously, sometimes it you know makes for a longer working day because it's five minutes uh, in and five minutes home. Um, but I think that that's what I'll miss the most, the convenience of being in town, of being able to walk or get access to um, eating places and restaurants that I normally would not have access to, uh, and, and being uh, not having to deal with the traffic uh, every day uh, in and out. Um, that um, is what I'll miss the most. Yeah, and on that point, when's the last time you drove a car? I I haven't uh, dr driven a car. I, and the last time was uh, when I took vacation. I think it was in 2018. My kids are terrified <laughs> about me uh, having to drive. I think I haven't lost it, but certainly on vacation when I did drive, they reminded me that um, the view is different from the driver's seat than from the passenger seat. So we'll have to see how that goes. It's like riding a bike. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, Governor Ige, thank you for joining us this morning, providing updates on a variety of topics. Uh, we always enjoy catching up with you and we appreciate uh, your time this morning. Thanks so much. Yeah. Aloha. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Well, of course, if you missed any part of this conversation, you can go back when the live stream is pow and watch in the beginning or catch it later as a podcast wherever you get your podcast or watch on Channel 50. Uh, we led, of course, the conversation with the news that has led the headlines for the last day and a half, and that is the changes to leadership of Aloha Stadium and what's to happen next with that plan, moving it from DAGS to DBED. The governor basically saying that the legislature has provided enough funding for the public-private partnership to not be as as essential of a component to how that whole, you know, project operates. He says the stadium itself is the priority. The entertainment district still important, but it sounds like not nearly as high level as it once was. Yeah, and really, he, he was stressing the fact that he believes that this route is more efficient, will be something that will help in the long run save potentially time and money, believing that this way and this path forward is the best path forward. Uh, we, you know, we are going to be speaking to DAG officials next week to get their take on where they think this came from because uh, this apparently caught them by surprise. But as the governor has led over the past eight years, the one thing that many people say is that he doesn't rush to any decision, that he takes his time 
Uh, and so we know that this was likely one of those situations where this was something that, you know, he has been considering for some time. Maybe he had he didn't speak about it and let the department know. Uh, but definitely he feels uh, that even in this only 11 weeks left in office for him, that this is what's best for the future of the project moving forward. And that this path, as he said, would make more sense in the long run. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to hear. Uh, we have a member of the stadium authority, along with Chris Kinimaka from DAGS, on next week to talk about. You know, they were they were invited to talk about the stadium. Now they'll be invited to talk about this change. So this is a huge public works project. I know a lot of people have plenty of opinions. The comment section I was reading it this morning on uh, Andrew's article, and uh, there people have a lot to say. So we continue this conversation next week. Uh, sticking with the rest of the news we talked about with the governor in his mind, the pandemic is not over. He doesn't quite agree with President Biden's assessment that the pandemic is POW, really encouraging people to get the bivalent vaccine, uh, if at all possible. And also he weighed in on the new appointment of Rear Admiral Wade to head up the Red Hill defueling process. Yeah, said he doesn't recognize the name. He doesn't think that he's met him yet, uh, but definitely thinks that this is a step in the right direction to have this point person. His concern uh, and his hope is that, uh, you know, Admiral Wade will stay in this position long enough to oversee the entire project and not be reassigned after a few years, saying that it is important to have continuity in this and that the military, he believes, is taking the right steps to right this wrong uh, and that the conversations have improved. The timeline, of course, is not up to the liking of many, but said that uh, they will continue to hold the military accountable for this plan and this timeline moving forward. And that overall, he believes that this appointment is, again, a step in the right direction. We also got his uh, take on or his announcement that he had some identity theft, which was uh, something that we've never heard of. That's right. That was very interesting. He said early on in the pandemic, when people were flooding the unemployment office with claims, uh, someone was able to steal his social security number and all of relevant information and actually try to file an unemployment claim in his name. We know that this happened to you know many other Hawaii residents. Very unexpected for that to happen to the governor himself. Not clear as to where that fraud claim is right now uh, in terms of catching the person who perpetrated that. But Interesting to hear the governor's firsthand experience with that. Uh, he hasn't driven a car since 2018. And so uh, in a few weeks, we will look forward to seeing him on the road. Yeah, that's right. Well, we uh, <laughs> always appreciate having the governor on and appreciate all the comments and questions that were submitted by our viewers. Uh, on Friday, we head back into the political world and spotlighting a race for the Senate. That's right. Republican Bob McDermott is leaving his role as a representative. He's represented Eva Beach for a very long time in the state legislature. Now he is challenging Brian Schatz for U.S. Senate. Uh, we're going to hear about his campaign, why he's decided to make this move at this point, and why he thinks it's time for a Republican to take that seat. So do join us right back here at 1030 on Friday for another edition of Spotlight Hawaii. We'll see you then. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Longstrugs.